Good morning and welcome back. For those of you who have joined us before, you'll know we went on a little bit of a break. Hopefully you missed us because we are back. And what better timing than February because February is heart month. My name is Chelsea Helms and I'm going to be your host today and for the next few weeks. If you've watched before, I might look familiar and that is because I have hosted multiple house call episodes in 2020 and I'm so, so, so excited to return for all of this Heart Month special programming. Today, we're discussing a very important issue, congenital heart defects in our show. It's gonna look a little bit different than what you might've been used to. First, we're presenting today's content in association with the Children's Heart Foundation. They're the perfect partner to help us tackle this issue. Just this morning, the American Heart Association and the Children's Heart Foundation announced $900,000 in funding for eight research projects that'll help healthcare professionals better understand, identify, and treat congenital heart defects. For those who don't know congenital heart defects or CHDS, we'll be referring to that a lot through the show, are problems present at birth that affect the structure and function of the heart. CHDS are America's most common birth defect with nearly 40,000 babies born with CHD every single year. We do have some special guests who will join us today, but before I introduce our first one, let me remind you of all of the ways you can participate throughout the show. Your involvement, it is key to our show, so we encourage you, you're watching us on YouTube right now, drop a line in the comments and let us know where you're joining us from today. Then make sure you like and subscribe to the American Heart Association YouTube channel so you can stay up to date with all of the House Calls content. Also, throughout the show, we're going to ask you to get involved by answering a few viewer questions. To respond, it's super easy. All you have to do, text AHA Live to 22333. See, take a look at your screen. Not hard at all. AHA Live to 22333. If you don't want to text in, go ahead and participate just by dropping your answer in the comments section as we go along. Now, I did mention that this show would be quite a bit different today, and that's because we have two CHD survivors who will join us to share their personal experience with us and how CHD has affected their life, their family's lives, and what they want you to know. These two women are part of the Go Red for Women, Real Women. The Real Women represent a sisterhood of women who actively, urgently, and passionately participate in the Go Red movement. Their volunteer work helps ensure every woman knows that her heart and cardiovascular health is her top concern. So let's go ahead. To kick us off, let's start with our first survivor who has navigated the long journey of CHD. Watch this. I was born with congenital heart disease. I had my first open heart surgery as a baby and my second when I was 15. I have spent my life overcoming congenital heart disease and spreading hope. Today, I am living fierce to empower others and I am proud to be a Go Red for Women Real Woman. All right, with me live is Rachel Owens. Rachel, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Uh, we'd love to hear a little bit more about your story, if we could. Sorry, I was that one in 100 born with a congenital heart defect, and I've been through every stage um, from a baby with the congenital heart disease into a teenager, a young woman, and now um, an adult. I've had two open heart surgeries and multiple procedures that now lead up to me having a defibrillator. And also now I went from patient to patient and parent. I now have a two-year-old who also has a congenital heart defects. So I've been through the highs and the lows, but um, it's been a journey that I'll continue to be on and I'm just optimistic about. I love the way that you put that. I went from patient to parent because you're absolutely right. You got to take care of yourself. And now you have this child you have to take care of. Uh, right. Could you tell us what your toughest part of the journey has been so far? I'll say my toughest part of my journey is knowing that I have my heart condition and that it's present, but not really knowing when issues will arise from it or when it will present itself as an issue. And um, going through life when some instances where I wasn't really prepared when it would present itself as an issue, for example, when I was in college and I collapsed 
from heart failure. And at that time I was having a lapse in proper care. Um, I had been seeing a general cardiologist, but hadn't really been teaching out an adult congenital heart defect doctor. So just not really knowing when an issue will arise and making sure that I'm prepared for it. Absolutely. Now, as a parent, what would you say to other parents who maybe are going through something similar, or maybe they just found out about their child's condition? Because, you know, this is probably a unique situation for other families. They, the parent might not have had it like you did. Exactly. Um, I would say if you have a child that has um, a congenital heart defect, whether you're a new parent or you're a parent that has been dealing with it for a while, just try to remember that your attitude behind it and the strength and positivity that you show will become your child's inner voice. So I know that the journey can be tough. Um, it can be hard to deal with at times, but just remember to take a minute to breathe, uh, ask for help when you can, and just try to be that positive voice for them that will one day become their own voice. Absolutely. And I think that they need that in this day and age, especially yeah. with everything else that's going on. Uh, as you know, uh, February, also Black History Month as an African American woman. What would you like our audience to walk away with uh, from this discussion that we're having today? Yes, happy Black History Month. I would um, like to say that Black women, about 50% or almost 50% of Black women over the age of 20 will have heart disease, but not very many of us consider it um, an issue that may arise. So I just want to encourage Black women to take charge of your health, be checked, especially if something feels off. But even if everything feels fine, just be your own advocate. I want us to live, I want us to thrive, and I want us to be there for our families. So just be in charge of your health and be sure to get checked out. Two, two great points. Be in charge of your health and get checked out. Thank you for joining us this morning, Rachel, and thank you for being such a great role model and advocate for women's health. We appreciate you. Thank you. All right. We'll be hearing from another CHD survivor coming up a little later in the show, but now we need to introduce our experts. Also with me this morning is Dr. Anitha John and Dr. Jennifer Romano. Dr. John is medical director of the Washington Adult Congenital Heart Program at Children's National Hospital in Washington, D.C. Dr. Romano is the Herbert Sloan Collegiate Professor of Cardiac Surgery, who is also a congenital heart surgeon at C.S. Mott Children's Hospital. Doctors, thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much for having us. Yes, before we dive into our discussion, let's start with a viewer response question. According to recent studies, death rates associated with congenital heart disease are on the decline, true or false. We're going to give people a little bit of time to weigh in. We know we have a lot of friends watching on our YouTube channel right now. So go ahead and take the time to vote if you are participating with us this morning. So once again, the question is, according to recent studies, death rates associated with congenital heart disease are on the decline. Uh, would one of you doctors like to weigh in on why someone might think this is either true or false? Well, you know, you can look at it in different ways. So one, when we look at death rates associated with congenital heart disease and patients requiring surgery in early childhood, there's been dramatic improvement in the care of those patients and many more are survivors. But as Dr. John will be able to answer, there we have more adults with congenital heart disease than ever before. So you also have to think about that population and how that weighs into the death rate related to congenital heart disease. All right, so Dr. John, is the answer true or false? I would say overall it's true. I think the fact that we have so many adult survivors of congenital heart disease, uh, you know, is a testament to all of the different therapies and, and treatments that have been developed over the years. Um, and I think for adult patients as well, too, as uh, Rachel had mentioned previously, staying in care, having specialized centers uh, that can really provide customized care for our patients, I think has overall improved both uh, mortality rates and morbidity rates in patients. Well, thank you so much for explaining that, Dr. John, and thank you everyone for taking the moment to go ahead and uh, participate in this question. We're gonna go ahead and move on and get started now with Health in the Headlines.
Each week, we select one current headline that further illustrates the topic at hand. We didn't have to look too far for this week's entry. Our own heart.org had an interesting story last week titled Hospice Candidate at Two. She's now 13 and thriving. I think this article sums up the immense difficulties patients and families endure when dealing with CHD. Dr. John, would you like to share some thoughts on this? Yes, you know, it's it's really interesting. I primarily take care of adult patients now just because, again, of the growth of the field and, and all of the wonderful new therapies that are now available for patients. And it's a very common story for our patients to come to us and uh, to relay the fact that they were told in childhood that they wouldn't make it to adulthood. Um, one particular patient was told when, uh, you know, he was born, his family was told that he wouldn't live past the age of 10. And his family threw him a huge, huge birthday party at the age of 10 because, you know, they figured this was sort of the milestone year. And he is now 50 years old, married with two teenage kids of his own. Um, and I, I think for families especially, you know, it can be frustrating because you want, you know, a set of therapies that you know are going to work. But part of congenital heart disease is that therapies are evolving. And oftentimes patients are writing their own natural history. Um, sometimes that can be a bit frustrating because you just want to know uh, what's going to work and, and have a defined uh, treatment path. But, you know, in other ways, uh, it's great to know that there are all sorts of new developing strategies that, you know, might take you in a completely different direction. So sort of a double edged sword. But it's it's a definitely a, a common uh, common feature that we hear from, especially from our adult patients. Yeah, hopefully they celebrated the next uh, milestone birthdays as well then. Sounds like great that he made it to 50. Um, once again, that headline, hospice candidate at two. She's now 13 and thriving. Let's give Dr. Romano a chance to weigh in on this. So I think this is a great example where the science and art of medicine intersect. And as Dr. John alluded to, you know, we have so many theories and plans on how we're going to treat these patients, but each patient is really very unique. And so it's hard when you counsel families as to the heart defect that their child has, the tendency is to immediately seek out any information source and kind of find what you can anticipate. But each patient is gonna ultimately take their own path and what may work for one patient may not necessarily work for the other. And especially when you get to patients that have quite complex congenital heart disease, they can have complications along the way that can really impact their long-term overall survival or the issue with comorbidities. But one of the most beneficial things is kids are incredibly resilient. It is very difficult to predict with any one child how they're going to be doing in two years based on how they're performing today. I've had many patients where I've gone into the hospital thinking that I'm going to have a conversation with a family that we need to redirect care and that we've run out of solutions just to come up with an idea on the way into the hospital of, hey, let's give this one more thing a try. And now that kid's in their teenage years. So it's, it's always a matter of working as a team, coming up with whatever new solutions and ideas we may have. The care for congenital heart disease patients is continuing to change dramatically with every year of research that we do. So what, for a child who may not have a great option today, they may have a great option if we can get them to tomorrow. I love the way you put that. All right, we have a lot of uh, questions coming in. So let's go ahead and move into our next segment. That is You Ask, We Answer. As a reminder, while we're talking today, you can submit your questions in the comments section wherever you're watching from right now, or you can submit them to us on heart.org slash house calls. We'd also love to hear your survivor story. So if you're feeling comfortable this morning, please go ahead, feel free to share those throughout the comment section as well. All right, this first question is for you, Dr. Romano. It's coming from Damon in Indiana. He asks, what are the chances for survival prognosis when a child has CHD? So that's really quite variable. It depends on what the patient's underlying diagnosis is. But in general, the prognosis for any patient with congenital heart disease is incredibly bright today. Even for our most complex congenital heart defects, the majority of those patients are expected to survive into adulthood. When you look across the board at mortality rates associated with patients with significant enough congenital heart disease that they require surgical intervention, 
the 30 day survival for those patients is excellent at roughly around 97%. And that's getting over the biggest hurdle. Obviously for some of our more extreme heart defects, survival rates are lower or need for repeated surgeries are higher. Um, what we're learning more though, what plays into the prognosis is just not about surviving, it's living your best life. It's about quality of life and really helping to manage kids with any morbidities that they may suffer as a result of the care that they need for their underlying heart disease. Most importantly, neural developmental issues and long-term health issues that impact their ability to really have a high quality of life as an adult. High quality of life, very important. Nan from Iowa wants to know, as a parent, how do you best take care of yourself, the caregiver, while caring for someone with CHD? Dr. John? I think this is an incredibly important question. I think, you know, if you remind yourself whenever you get on the airplane and you have the instructions for the oxygen mask, the instructions are to put the mask on yourself first so that you can better care for those who are around you. Uh, and it's really the same thing, I think, for parents as well, too. It's very easy to get overwhelmed uh, with the care of your child, uh, especially when they have any chronic uh, illness, but certainly with CHD. Um, so I think it's you know very important for uh, families to build a really good support network and to be able to take time for yourself. Um, there's also a high rate of you know anxiety and you know mental health issues that can come with caring for a family member with a chronic health condition. Uh, and I think it's really important to seek uh, help if you feel that you need additional supports with counseling uh, or you know additional mental health supports. Um, for my uh, practice, you know, we have many patients who are uh, transitioning to us uh, from their adolescent years as they grow into adulthood. And so we have many, many patients who uh, come to our visits with their uh, parents, despite the fact that they're young adults, uh, partly because there's a high degree of anxiety in the parents in terms of, um, in terms of letting go and having their child take uh, independent care. Uh, of their own uh, health condition. So I think one thing that often does help um, is really kind of uh, modifying your role a bit, you know, and really thinking that as your child grows with congenital heart uh, disease, depending on their developmental abilities, really to try and become more of that empowering force um, and helping your child really learn how to take care of their healthcare needs. Um, I think watching them actually do it during their adolescent and early adulthood years oftentimes alleviates a good bit of anxiety for uh, parents as they start watching their uh, child uh, take independent care of their life. Um, but I think at the same time, understanding that that can be very anxiety provoking mm -hmm. and seeking the supports that you need is really important. I also think it's really important to have some time away uh, from your child's um, medical condition really to make some time for yourself as well too. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing that, Dr. John. Here's one from Norma in sunny Destin, Florida, which I'm sure we all wish we were there, right, Dr. John? This one's also for you. Are there other conditions that happen with CHD, like comorbidity? Yes, we're learning a lot more about that now. There are certainly lesion-specific things. So depending on what your underlying congenital heart defect is, uh, we do see sequela as you grow into adulthood. I think one of the more studied populations is the single ventricle Fontan population. There are a number of different clinics that are being set up across the country to offer multidisciplinary care and evaluation. Um, so I think it's important not to make too many generalizations because there are lots of different congenital heart defects and, you know, you don't want to generalize one, um, the, the comorbidities for one defect with another. So having a discussion with your uh, physician, I think, is really important to really kind of uh, delineate what's, you know, what are the things that you have to watch for. Um, certainly a number of patients in their pediatric uh, age ranges can experience issues with growth. So that, again, you know, can be patient specific. As Dr. Romano alluded to before, uh, neurocognitive deficits are something uh, that I think is also being better evaluated, especially in the pediatric age range. Um, up to about 50% of patients can have some form of mild neurocognitive deficit. These can include learning disabilities, uh, abilities to you know, help uh, perform adequately in school. So it's really important that patients um, seek a formal evaluation uh, and make sure that they don't have any issues that need to be dealt with. And parents can often ask their providers about that uh, and they can steer them in that direction. Um, mental health issues are also something that, you know, we see, especially in the uh, older adolescent adult population, um, uh, up to about 40% of patients can have uh, mental health issues 
uh, that oftentimes are undiagnosed or untreated. So it's also important to be cognizant of that um, and to seek therapies uh, whenever is needed. Dr. Romano, Jasmine from Washington State wants to know, what are the most severe CHDS and what kind of surgeries would be involved? So as Dr. John alluded to, there's a very wide spectrum of defects that fall under the category of congenital heart defects. We often think of the most severe ones are those that require any surgery or intervention at all, as there are many kids with congenital heart disease who will not require an intervention, but require ongoing follow-up. But when we look at those that are going to require either a surgery or an intervention in the cath lab during their childhood, the most severe forms are those where portions of the heart are either underformed or absent. So this can be such as, as a ventricle, so our patients with single ventricle heart defects that are gonna need to have a series of palliations to make their heart function with one, just one pumping chamber. And those patients often have lifelong ongoing medical and interventional needs. The other category are those patients who have valves that don't work well, valves that ultimately require replacement. The challenge is if you're a small child and we need to replace your valve, there's growth throughout childhood. And so they're going to require repeated surgeries that have associated risks with them to have those valves replaced as they get bigger with time. So those are the heart defects that we would consider to be the most significant, as well as those that would otherwise be life-threatening or life-limiting in the newborn period without a surgical intervention. Thankfully, many of those severe heart defects, such as transposition of great arteries, truncus arteriosus, are defects that can be repaired with overall good long-term survival. That is good news. Great discussion we're having so far and such a deeply personal topic that deeply affects so many. We have a lot more questions to get to, but let's shift gears for just a moment and hear from another survivor who has lived this. Take a look. I was born with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, meaning I only had the right side of my heart. My first surgery was at four days old my second was at 18 months, my third was at five years old, and my fourth was at 13 years old with a pacemaker. At 16, after being in congestive heart failure, I received my heart transplant. Today, I am living fierce as a survivor by being an advocate and supporting congenital heart defect research that gives those like me hope for a future. All right, everyone, meet Jessica Cowan. Jessica, welcome to House Calls. Jessica, you might be muted if you could unmute yourself for us. Um, thank you. I'm happy to be here. Would you mind just going over your story briefly with us? Yeah, of course. I was born with basically half a heart. Um, it's called hypoplastic left heart syndrome, and I only had the right side of my heart. So I did end up um, requiring multiple surgeries to repair. And ultimately, when I was about 15, I was in congestive heart failure. I had had a pacemaker uh, put in when I was 13, and you know my heart just started to fail. And ultimately, I needed a, a heart transplant at the age of 16. And um, I am closing in on my 22nd year post heart transplant and um, about 10 years post heart transplant, uh, I was in renal failure, I was in kidney failure and my sister ended up needing to donate her kidney, kidney to me. So I, I have gone through a couple of transplants there. So um, uh, also approaching about 12 years post transplant for my kidney. Wow, incredible. And sounds like you have some incredible support on your journey as well. Would you like to tell us kind of where things stand with you on your health journey? Yeah, I am doing really well. Um, my heart's functioning great. You know, I have my yearly checkups and check-ins with my cardiologist, but ultimately I'm very lucky to have a heart um, that's doing so well. And um you know, it was a long journey. It was a hard journey. It was a rough journey for myself, my family. But like you said, um, support is incredible. Doctors, my doctors were incredible, are incredible. Um, and I'm just, you know, doing my best to live the life that I've 
been so greatly given a second chance for. Plus, you can have several different birthdays to celebrate <laughs> each of the new new uh, parts of you, right? Yes, yeah, so we do celebrate each birthday. Um, I think my actual birthday is not as important to my family and I as my heart anniversary and my kidney anniversary. So I love to hear that. Celebrate those, yeah. I'm sure those are very exciting days. Now, based on your background and your role with the Children's Heart Foundation, your story carries beyond just your personal role, role, personal health rather. So can you explain what has your role with the Children's Heart Foundation taught you? Yeah, oh my gosh, it's taught me so much. I'm the manager of research and advocacy and it's taught me the great responsibility I have to make sure we continue to fund the most promising research. And we only can do that through our independent research process, which is going to be opening this month. And along with our you know, announcement from the American Heart Association and the Children's Heart F Foundation Congenital Heart Defect Research Awards, um, which were just announced today. Um, it's taught me, you know, just the importance of how and why we fund research. Um, it's, it's something that is so necessary, so needed for all of our congenital heart defect patients and myself included. And just to remind everyone who's watching that $900,000 you're talking about is funding that'll be used for eight research projects. So truly incredible, incredible stuff there. And we are really investing in the care. Um, what would you like to tell people who are joining us today? You know, what's something you want them to walk away from this discussion having in their back of their mind or maybe at the forefront of their mind? That there's hope. There's hope for us patients. There's hope in the research. Um, and, and knowing that the most important thing is continuing to fund this congenital heart defect research is what I would hope that people leave with um, an understanding of how important it really is. Um, could, because without the research that the Children's Heart Foundation has funded, I wouldn't be here. And I know people, um, several friends who, you know, wouldn't be here without the research from the Children's Heart Foundation as well. Well, we're so excited that they are investing in more care. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. I know your story is something other survivors can relate to, which is important. And I hope that everyone out there is listening and has learned something from you today as well. I'd like to invite any of our audience members to share their stories too. Please feel free to use the comments section if you're comfortable sharing with us, or even if you know someone who is a CHD survivor. We do want to celebrate and honor all of those who have been affected. So thanks again for joining us. I know a lot of you have been giving us questions throughout the show and we want to address them. So let's go ahead and get back into it. Dr. Romano, I'm going to come back to you first. Kimberly in Little Rock asks, how do you best equip your child and family to handle the psychological effects of CHD? Dr. Romano, go ahead and unmute if you would, please. Sorry, that is a great question. I want to go back to something that Dr. John mentioned earlier and the analogy to the action on the airplane. You know, most important is to make sure that as a parent, you have good support and you have been able to educate yourself, know how to write, ask the right questions about what your child is going to need and how you can best advocate for them. There are so many different support networks out there for parents to help them navigate these waters when you receive a diagnosis of congenital heart disease within your child. The other is to really lean on your hospitals. They have a tremendous resources, both for parents and for children. Uh, all hospitals have really increased their focus on children's well-being through a hospitalization or need for any medical care. So centers have child life specialists, individuals who really are trained in using the right language and imaging to help kids understand what they can expect and anticipate from an upcoming experience in the hospital that can be so incredibly helpful and meaningful for these children. The last thing we want them to do is have fear of coming to the hospital or fear of feeling pain or suffering. So it's really using that whole team that's part of any congenital heart center, 
the child life specialists, social workers that can help support both parents and children, and also using all the great resources that are out there for parents in terms of advocacy. Many provide you with tools of how to know how to ask the right questions and to how to even find what's the best place to go for the care of your child. This diagnosis can be incredibly overwhelming at first, but there are so many people that are out there to support you. There are also incredible parent networks out there, people who have walked the same walk that you're going to walk, that can help give you guidance as to what you need, how to best support yourself and your whole family's well-being. I think quite often we forget that it's the entire family that experiences a congenital heart disease diagnosis, not just the child. Um, so how best to also navigate this with siblings, uh, extended family, those are all really important elements to take into consideration. Yeah, sounds like doing your own research can really make such a difference for the care you receive. Uh, Dr. John Reed from Austin, Texas wonders, what are long-term effects of CHD in adults and can you live a normal life with CHD? Well, absolutely, you can live a normal life with CHD. I think, you know, as we have talked about throughout um, this program, there are lots of different types of congenital heart defects and they can be associated with different types of complications. Uh, some patients may need pacemakers or defibrillators. Other patients may need to be on medications. You may have some patients who have um, uh, problems with congestive heart failure. And then you have other patients who, you know, don't require any medications, may not, you know, need any other uh, types of surgeries or procedures. Uh, one of the really important things to note, uh, and it was mentioned by one of the patients earlier, is the need to really stay in specialized care. It's uh, so important not to have lapses in care. There are uh, lots of different uh, research studies that have shown that patients who fall out of care have increasing levels of complications and oftentimes represent you know, when they are declining. And it's oftentimes harder to uh, treat from that aspect than it is to be proactive about things. I would say definitely for women with congenital heart disease, it is very important to see a congenital heart disease specialist as you are planning pregnancy. Um, there are certain uh, types of defects that carry different rates of complications. Um, and then there are, you know, are other defects that you will do absolutely fine during pregnancy. And it's just important really to be educated about uh, what your potential risks are. But with regards to you know, leading a, a normal life, um, you know, there may be certain limitations for certain patients or adjustments for certain patients, but most definitely patients can uh, lead a full life. Uh, and as Dr. Romano mentioned uh, previously, you know, our goal isn't just survival, but is really to help you uh, lead the best life possible. Yeah, and I think we saw that example in both Jessica and Rachel, our CHD survivors who have joined us today. So very thankful that we could have them on this program. We have a couple of more questions just to get to, and then we're going to be out of time. So Dr. Romano, let's go to you. Rhonda in Delaware asking, how do you get extended family, friends to understand the ramifications of having a child with CHD? Another great question. And again, your family and your friends are ultimately going to be your best support, but helping them know how to support you is really important. And this is where it gets to education, education, education. The more you understand your child's underlying heart defect and their needs, and then your ability to be able to share that with your extended family and friends so they understand what you're dealing with and what you're navigating is incredibly helpful. And also realizing that it's not a diagnosis that means there isn't hope. And I think that's one of the hardest things is quite often it's feeling very sad about a diagnosis, but realizing that being supportive and having hope and giving these children the life that they deserve and helping them live a full life. Um, but I think what's most important is just to be able to clearly express to friends and family how they can best help you. We often see families that are really trying to be helpful and quite often it can become more of a problem or cumbersome than actually helpful. And it's just being able to advocate for yourself of what your needs are. And quite often, this is also where your healthcare providers can help you with, these are some things that may be able to better support you along the way. And friends and family, again, are always going to be the most beneficial people on your side as you navigate these challenging waters. Always important to have them by your side in these these times. We have one last question for you, Dr. John. This is coming from Lori in Denver. She wonders what resources are available for people who are living with or caring for someone with CHD. 
That's a great question. I think that's oftentimes uh, something that we hear from a lot of our patients is this feeling of isolation that they're uh, in this all alone. And in actuality, there are a number of different resources that are available. Uh, the Children's Heart Foundation website, childrenheartfoundation.org, is a great place to start uh, to take a look at partner organizations and also to see what research is currently active in the space. Uh, certainly, the American Heart Association website does have resources for patients. Uh, but there are several uh, fairly well-known uh, advocacy organizations for patients and family members. Uh, the Adult Congenital Heart Association, achaheart.org, is a great place for patients to go to. They have a series of uh, different pre-recorded webinars uh, that are topics of interest to patients. They have uh, ways to be able to have um, various different social supports, including peer ambassadors uh, that might be able to talk to patients and their families about particular conditions, and just a wealth of resources, including a clinic directory, which is, I think, very important uh, for patients as they get older to make sure that they stay in care. Um, conquering CHD and Mended Little Hearts are more focused towards the pediatric and adult population, and so that those are also organizations that you can take a look at um, to be able to see a variety of different resources that I think, you know, is really great for uh, patients and their families. Um, and then I would encourage patients and their families to also actively participate in research. Uh, the Congenital Heart um, uh, Foundation, I think, again, lists a lot of the active research in the area, but as studies are uh, coming forward, uh, certainly this is how we learn and how we can make improvements in the field. So it also empowers patients, I think, to be involved in the process. Yes, always take advantage of those resources. Up next, we're going to round out today's discussion with a little bit of CHD education with some help from Drs. John and Romano. So let's go ahead and play Triple Trivia. Triple Trivia is sponsored by Crazy Cool Science, our new social media campaign that pumps up the fun in science. Science is everywhere and Crazy Cool Science proves it. We've got three trivia questions lined up to test your scientific knowledge. Today's focus, of course, CHD. Drop your answer in the comments section or text in with your answer and we will find out if we have an audience of experts today. Let's go ahead and take a look at our first question. The term heart failure makes it sound like the heart is no longer working at all and there's nothing that can be done. Heart failure actually means that the heart is doing what as well as it should be. So the heart is doing what as well as it should be. So our options are A, beating, B, pumping, C, resting, and D, receiving blood. We're going to give everyone a chance to go ahead and take their time to answer, but we want to know. What does the heart, the term heart failure mean? Um, looks like we already have some people, doctors weighing in and saying pumping. Why might someone think that maybe it's supposed to be beating? Well, first I have to say, I really dislike this term. I think it can often be so deceiving um, because it does, it makes you think that the heart is failing and can't recover. And really what right. it means is the heart's just working harder than it needs to. And really the heart, the squeeze is its muscle, it, that's its factory. So, you know, beating is how fast your heart beats. So when we all take a jog or have to exert ourselves, our heart rate goes up. So it'd be normal to kind of think that beating could be potentially the right answer. I think that the way you put that is right. It's very misleading saying heart failure when it's essentially overworking. Dr. John, did you want to weigh in at all? You know, it's it's interesting. If you look across the country at both adult and pediatric centers, there are many programs that are actually changing the name of, you know, their heart failure clinic because, again, it, it sounds awful. Um, and uh, that was actually at the feedback of patients that, you know, this was very alarming to come in and, and to be referred to a heart failure clinic. Um, so many programs are now calling it advanced cardiac therapies, which mm. I think is a lot more appropriate for sure. Um, I think in general, you know, people do think of sort of pumping, you know, the heart pump function as being what's responsible for uh, the inability of the heart to get enough blood out. But, you know, in congenital heart disease, all of those different things, beating, pumping, resting, receiving blood, they can all play a factor 
uh, in, you know, that general term heart failure. And so an an equal reason to really see someone who's specialized in the care to know what the appropriate treatment needs to be um, to help you live your best life. Well, and I think you kind of hit it on the head. It's like you're already stressed out about what's going on with your body than to have to walk into a clinic that's called heart failure. If that's not uh, nerve wracking enough, I don't know what would be. All right, let's go ahead and move on to our next question. It is, in what ways does the heart try to make up for the lack of oxygen being sent to the body? So these are options. A, enlarging. B, developing more muscle mass. C, pumping faster. Or D, all of the above. So in what ways does the heart try to make up for the lack of oxygen being sent to the body? Go ahead, everyone. Start sending in your answers, please. Uh, Dr. Romano, would you like to weigh in on this question before we give away the answer? Oh, I don't even know if I gave away the answer for the last one. It was B, pumping. So as we move on to this one now. (laughs) So this gets back to a little bit of the last question again of heart failure. There's so many different causes for heart failure. And so there's different compensatory mechanisms that your body's gonna need to take into consideration to overcome what's causing that quote unquote heart failure or your heart not being able to do as much as it needs to do for you. For example, a child with a large hole in their heart, their heart just has to work harder because it has to compensate for that hole in their heart. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a long-term problem, but how their body compensates in the short term. So, you know, it really depends on what is the cause. Is it a lack of blood flow to the heart muscle? Is it a hole within one of the chambers of the heart that makes the heart work harder? Is it a valve that's not working well? They all need a little bit of a different response to how the body addresses that additional need. Sure. So the answer to this one is D, all of the above. Dr. John, I'd love to hear your comments on this question. Yeah, I think it's also really important for patients to realize that, you know, even if they have, you know, uh, uh, symptoms of heart failure, it doesn't always mean that they're going to be in heart failure for the rest of their life. As Dr. Mm. Nano mentioned, you know, there are certain heart defects that cause some of these different compensatory mechanisms or may lead to symptoms of heart failure, but, you know, some of them are easily correctable and, you know, may reverse what those symptoms are. So just because you have heart failure at one moment in time doesn't mean that that's going to be, you know, your course for the, for your entire life. You're right. It does sound like something that's going to just kind of last forever. So thank you for clarifying that for us. All right. Here's our last trivia question for the day. According to the CDC, roughly how many adults in the U.S. suffer from heart failure? There's that word again, ladies, that we're not so fond of. Um, These options, I mean, just looking at the options alone, they're in the millions. I mean, A is 1.4 million. We have 4.7 for B. C is 6.2 or D is 10.3. I mean, any way you slice it, we've got a lot of millions of people who are really suffering from heart failure. Um, Dr. John, love to give you a chance to weigh in while people are going ahead and uh, answering for us. So I think the tough part about this is the CDC uh, estimates factor in all adults um, within the U.S. And there are many different reasons for heart failure. You can have uh, ischemic heart disease. You can have different cardiomyopathies, um, different things that can cause heart failure as you get older. Uh, Congenital heart defects, I don't think we have an exact number in terms of how many adults in the U.S. um, suffer from heart failure who have congenital heart disease. And I think that's a really important thing to highlight. You know, I mentioned before um, the Adult Congenital Heart Association, uh, they have helped pilot and launch a registry for adults with congenital heart disease so that we can get a better idea within the U.S. how many patients are really suffering from these complications. So I would encourage, you know, patients to be able to participate in various studies like that. Um, But I think, you know, that's an area that's uh, ripe for more research for sure. Well, it looks like we have a lot of experts at home. They've got all the questions correct today. C is correct. 6.2 million people are living right now in the U.S. with heart failure or who have suffered from heart failure because we know it's not something that kind of just sticks around. Uh, Dr. Romano, that's a lot of people living with it. 
It is. And I think what we you know, know is that there are so many different variables that are risk factors for the development of heart disease. And even though we are aware of many of them, it's still a growing problem in the United States of people being at risk for heart disease and subsequently developing heart failure. And I think that's where uh, Rachel Owen said it well at the, earlier on in the session today about awareness. It's being aware of what risk factors do you have and potentially put you at risk for heart failure and being aware of them and how you can potentially mitigate them to reduce your risk of developing heart failure. But this is a tremendous problem for patients who are either born with congenital heart disease or those of us who have a structurally normal heart, but ultimately either have inherent risk factors or lifestyle choices that put us at risk. All right, Dr. Romano, Dr. John, thank you both for talking us through those trivia questions and playing along with us. And thank you for taking the time to submit your answers. We so appreciate it. Um, we do think it's so important to take the time to raise knowledge and awareness of CHD. It's such an important topic and need, and you both have really helped us do that today. So I want to give both of you the opportunity to have the floor before we say goodbye. So uh, Dr. John, how about we start off with you? I just want to say thank you to the American Heart Association for uh, doing this. I think, you know, it's really important to bring more awareness uh, to folks who are survivors of uh, congenital heart disease. I think it's there's a bright future, lots of ongoing research as evidenced by uh, what the Children's Heart Foundation is doing right now. Uh, we really appreciate uh, the partnership with the American Heart Association and, you know, really spurring research forward. I would encourage patients to really be um, educated about, you know, their heart defects and uh, have an understanding of where they need to go for care and, and participate in research whenever you can. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. John. Dr. Romano, the floor is yours. I would just like to say I really appreciate the opportunity to be part of this event. I think this is so important. The fact that the American Heart Association and the Children's Heart Foundation have collaborated over the past several years in terms of collaborative funding, some of the most promising research in congenital heart disease has been a tremendous benefit for all those patients out there who are living with congenital heart disease. Having uh, events like this where we are increasing the public's awareness about congenital heart defects, how incredibly prevalent they are, how many people out there are living with an underlying congenital heart defect is incredibly important because quite often when we think about heart disease, we think about those patients who have traditional risk factors for heart disease in the elderly and forget all those young children and adults who are out there living with heart disease as well, but from a different cause. And I think when we increase this awareness, it helps with people really trying to be advocates for this patient population, contributing to research to help us better understand how to care for these children going forward. And as was stated earlier, $900,000 in research dollars going out today from the American Heart Association, the Children's Heart Foundation, to change the lives of these patients tomorrow is just a tremendous uh, tribute to everybody that's involved and has really made an event like this today uh, possible. Absolutely. Dr. Romano, thank you for joining us. And thank you to all of you who have watched us along at home this morning. We're so lucky to have you. We had two CHD survivors and two experts. I mean, how could we learn even better information than with these people that we had today? So we are so lucky. Remember, if you'd like to visit any of our previous shows, you can do so at heart.org slash house calls. And don't forget, since there are always more questions than we have the time to answer live, you can find answers to anything we didn't get to today on our House Calls After Show. You can look for it Thursday on the American Heart Association YouTube. Next week, we'll continue our focus on women's health as we discuss maternal health. We have more special appearances from our real women. And so I hope you enjoyed hearing those personal stories today. Before you go, don't forget to like and subscribe to the American Heart Association channel. Once again, I'm Chelsea Hounds, and I'll see you right here next week. In the meantime, we invite you to subscribe and listen to the AHA's new podcast, Stories of the Relentless. Enjoy a compelling story on health equity that celebrates the life and legacy of Bernard J. Tyson, available everywhere podcasts are heard. I'll be 110, still alive. Rocking in a rocking chair, reflecting. Reflecting as history is writing what we did on our watch. 
So how will history record us? Well, the chairman and CEO of Kaiser Permanente died suddenly. Bernard Tyson died in his sleep early Sunday morning. In a statement, Kaiser says Tyson was an outstanding leader, a visionary and champion for high quality, affordable health care for all Americans. For the company's first black CEO, Tyson was a champion for accessible health care, racial justice and workplace diversity. He was just 60 years old. The American Heart Association's mission is to be a relentless force for a world of longer, healthier lives. In our pursuit of that mission, we're having some amazing conversations along the way. Welcome to the special edition series on equity, honoring the life, leadership, and legacy of Bernard J. Tyson. These are the stories of the relentless. Learn more about house calls, real docs, real talk, and submit your questions at heart.org.